Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. For many people, nighttime and low light photography can seem so daunting. And I know that firsthand because I've been there myself. It can seem that no matter what we do, our photos come out noisy, blurry, muddy, and generally looking like a bit of a mess. Although we shouldn't compare, at the end of the day, we're human and we do. We compare our photos to those photographers who are known for nighttime photography, and we end up feeling a little bit deflated because at the end of the day, their work is just so much cleaner and so much better. And sometimes we don't even know where to start. Well, in this video, I wanna share a few tips with you that I personally use to improve my nighttime photography, not only from an experience point of view, but also from getting clean images that don't have any real noise in them, that don't have any motion blur, and that have that cinematic and dynamic look and feel. Light is by far the most important aspect of daytime photography and at night it becomes even more crucial. Without light, you don't have a photo. Without good light, you have a rubbish photo. You can even argue that finding good light at nighttime is actually a little bit easier than it is during the day because you just have to go to the same places, the same shop windows, the same neon signs to get that light as opposed to trying to see where the clouds are, where the sun is where the light will bounce from, etc. So seek out good light. That can come from shop fronts, from big billboards, from advertising screens on the side of uh, bus stations. It can be from neon signs. It could be from cars, from traffic, and even street lighting that's very bright. And sometimes you will find that your favorite area to shoot during the day is pretty crap at night, and you'll just have to change locations. When you do find good light, you wanna position yourself either facing into the light or 90 degrees to the light. Effectively, the light source will have to travel around your subject, giving it rim light, giving it contrast, giving it a 3D appearance before going into the camera. Now, I made a whole dedicated video about lighting, which I suggest you watch after this video, which will explain this in more detail, but the main thing to keep in mind is the light source is either behind the subject or you're shooting into the light or to the side of the subject and you're shooting 90 degrees to the light. You don't particularly wanna be shooting away from the light because as you can see, the results are not as pleasing. When shooting at night, we're typically working with lower shutter speeds and with an environment where it takes us longer to see opportunities, to see subjects, and to see compositions. And because of that, one of the most important things that we can do is to just slow everything down. When I say everything, I literally mean everything. Slow down your uh, walking pace. Slow down how you go about taking photos. So for example, with me, if you've seen any of my POV videos, you'll know that during the day, I run around like a headless chicken and I take photos without even stopping. Sure, during the day when my shutter speed is one over 2000, not a problem. But at night time, that approach will completely destroy me and it has many times before. So if you see an opportunity, stop, check your settings, take your time, and take the photo, and if you miss it, you miss it. But at least it's better to miss something than to just end up with a bunch of blurry photos because I'd rather walk away with one or two good images that are clean, that are not blurry, than to walk away with 50 images where none of them are useful because they're all blurry, out of focus, and just a bit of a mess. Now, a big part of slowing down is finding a way to stabilize your camera even more. Because if we just use our two hands, we introduce a lot of unnecessary camera movements and micro jitters. Now, if you have IBIS, that can help you, but even that only works to a certain degree. And the tips I'm gonna share now apply to every camera and every lens. Obviously, the longer the lens you're using, the more attention you have to pay to these tips, not to add any more camera shake. So the first one is the easiest one, and that is to just simply 
use a viewfinder and press your camera against your face quite firmly. By doing so, you're adding a third point of contact and you're removing some of the jitters and some of the micro shakes that you will get just hand holding the camera. Now, of course, not every camera has a viewfinder and if you're in that position, just changing how you hold the camera can have a huge impact. So most people will hold the camera sort of like this. Right arm will be on the grip, left arm will be holding the lens from the side, mainly to zoom in and out, right? Well, if you just shift your left arm and actually place it underneath the camera and try and take as much of the weight of the camera with your left arm as possible, and your right arm is there to do further support, but also to actuate the shutter, do the button settings, etc. Now, if you're the type of person that uses a neck strap, then this tip will really help you. Simply put the neck strap around your neck like you normally would and literally push the camera away from you until the neck strap is tight against you and obviously the camera. This creates a third point of contact and will remove a bunch of micro jitters and movements. Obviously, it's not the most, let's say, inconspicuous way of taking photos. However, it definitely stabilizes the camera further. It's a technique that I personally use quite a lot. And finally, just find something to lean on. It could be a wall, it could be a lamppost, it could be anything, right? Because when you're leaning on something, you're spreading the weight a little bit, but also you're just adding a third point of contact. And if you really want to improve on that further, just use the neck strap or the viewfinder whilst you're leaning. And then, you know, the chances of you having any kind of camera shake or movements, it just reduces so much, which means you can use a slower shutter speed with more confidence. Now, sometimes even that is not enough. And that's where reducing any camera movements from actually pressing the shutter button comes in quite important because it does happen. When you press the shutter, you do introduce a bit of camera movement. Obviously, it depends on how aggressively you press that shutter and it can vary, but you do. So there are a couple of things you can do to get around it. The first one is to use a burst mode. And let's say you take a burst of five images, maybe the first one or two will have a bit of motion blur because you've pressed the shutter, but then the third, fourth and fifth will be absolutely fine because by that point, the camera wasn't really moving. Another way of doing it, if you don't want to fill up your memory card or you have the luxury of waiting and you don't need to time something, is using a two second timer. I know a lot of landscape people do it and for good reason. By using a two second timer, it gives you two seconds to compose yourself, to hold your breath, to you know pull on that neck strap extra tight, but also means you're not pressing and you're not moving the camera at the same time as taking the photo. So if you take everything that I've just said, if you're leaning on something, if you're using your neck strap, if you're using a two second timer, then you will see a huge difference compared to just holding the camera in front of you. And the final tip is the one that most people find counterintuitive and even raise eyebrows when I mention it, and that is to underexpose your shots. So put your camera into aperture priority or auto, doesn't matter, go out at night and leave the exposure compensation at zero. Look at the back of the screen and then look at what's in front of you. I can guarantee you that the screen looks much brighter. Why does that happen? Well, because cameras tend to slightly overexpose at night. However, now drop your exposure down to let's say minus 1.3 and now do the same comparison. You'll probably find that the two look a lot closer together. Not only underexposing at night gives you a more realistic picture, pun not intended, of what reality versus the back of your camera looks like, but also there are other added benefits like your ISO drops down because you're underexposing or your shutter speed goes up or a combination of both. So you end up with a higher shutter speed, lower ISO, and a more realistic picture. So next time you go out, try this, and I can guarantee you, you will come home and you will be surprised with the results. At this point, I wanna to mention today's video sponsor, which is Squarespace. With more of us working from home or even quitting our day jobs to focus on our own goals and dreams, there's never been a better time to have your own corner of the internet, be it just a portfolio to show off your best work or even an all-in-one platform to run your project or business. Squarespace offer easy templates to get you going and you can even register your first domain too. My philosophy on life is simplicity and having everything managed within Squarespace definitely makes my life, well, simpler. If you want to try them yourself, there is a trial period after which you can use the code RomanFox to get 10% off your first order. So simply follow the link below to find out more. Thank you again to Squarespace for supporting and thank you again to you for watching. Okay, that's all for today's video, but before I leave, I wanna ask you a question. How do you shoot at night? Are there any particular techniques that you use when you go out 
in low light and if so share them down below so that everyone can learn from you okay that's all thank you again stay safe have a good week have a good day it's been emotional and i'll speak to you soon bye